You heard me tell the rest of them. These pictures are not for sale. I paint them for my own amusement. I am a great artist, and I like to see my own work all around me. That's why I will never, never let one single picture go. Now, if you've got any ideas you're going to steal one of my pictures, just get it out of your head. And another thing, that gun of yours doesn't frighten me one bit. It doesn't frighten me one bit. Uh, why, you... Uh, missed. Dr. Danfield, student of crime psychology, has many times provided the police with a solution to a baffling crime. There's an interesting case ahead for the doctor today. We'll call it Death Paints a Picture. Death Valley. They sure named it right, Dan. How can people stand living out in such a lonely place as this? Oh, usually they have some psychological quirk, Rusty. Either they've been wronged by someone, or they themselves have wronged someone. They can't stand people, so they bury themselves in loneliness. Practical escapism. <laughs> I'd rather lose myself in a crowd. Then there are some people who just love the desert. Well, it gives me the shivers. Yeah, we better start looking for a place to put up for the night. You said it. Yeah, I see. According to the information given us by the auto club, there should be a place coming up pretty soon. A place called Shoshone Wells Hotel. Well, we'll probably drive right on past it the way this sand is blowing. Yes, I don't like it. Automobiles have been covered up with that stuff. Oh, Dan, don't say things like that. <laughs> well, you can stop worrying, Rusty. There's the hotel. That awful looking place? Yeah, we can't be choosy at a time like this. Yeah, I guess we turn in here, not much sign of a road. Sand's blown over it. Oh, isn't there some other place, Dan, further on? Not for 80 or 90 miles, there isn't. Oh. Yeah, well, here we are. I don't like this place, Dan. Oh, well, we'll be on our way in the morning. Right now, I'm hungry, and I want to get inside somewhere where I can get this sand out of my eyes. Come on. Oh, and you don't help either, Mr. Coyote. Yeah, let's see now. Yes, yes, there's that doorbell. Oh. Huh. Hines in a place like this? Yes, it does seem rather odd, doesn't it? Well, at least there's somebody here. It isn't closed for the winter. Oh. Well, uh, good evening. My secretary and I would like rooms for the night. Oh, well, well, come right in. Come right into my poor establishment. Why, Dan, he... Quite right, Dan. Um, I'm Dr. Daniel Danfield, and this is my secretary, Miss Fairfax. Uh, a doctor? Well, I'm very fond of doctors. They're always convenient to have in attendance when anyone dies. In a moment, we'll return for the second act of Danger, Dr. Danfield, but first... Back to Michael Dunn for the second act of Danger, Dr. Danfield. And uh, my name is Borax Bedlow. Well, we're very glad to meet you, Mr. Bedlow. Especially with this dust storm blowing up. Believe me, your hotel is a haven indeed. Yes, 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 dust storms. I'm very fond of dust storms, Doctor. There'll be many dead things in the morning. Uh, Dan... Don't you think we'd better... Oh, don't be frightened, young lady. Death is a very common occurrence here in Death Valley. Uh, that's not a misnomer, you know. You're cheering me up no end. Uh, if you'd care to join us, dinner is now being served. Yes, yes, indeed we would. Follow me. Dan, this place is screwy. That, that borax bed, now, with that old tobacco-stained beard and that cultured voice. They don't fit. Well, the desert breeds strange creatures, Rusty. Uh, here we are, Doctor. Yeah, uh, you and Miss Fairfax may sit at the foot of the table. We serve here family style. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bedlow. And now I would like to make you acquainted with the rest of my guests. Miss Fairfax and Dr. Danfield, Sue Pierce. How do you do? Miss Pierce? Mrs. Oh. And her husband, Mr. Harvey Pierce. Oh, good evening. Huh. 
Mr. Pierce is a landscape painter, Doctor. He's here to do desert scenes. Oh? I'm uh, very fond of desert scenes. I'm a great admirer of Remington. Remington? Bah! A mud dauber. I am the greatest landscape artist who ever lived. You should see his latest, Dr. Danfield, a picture of a dead cow. <laughs> I should have to. Ugh. Rusty, are you uh, turning Indian? And uh, this is uh, Mr. Kenneth Wakefield. I'm an art connoisseur, Doctor. I came here expressly to buy some of Pierce's paintings. They're really good, you know. Buy my paintings? Never. They're mine. Mine to admire and enjoy. Everybody in this place is more than slightly nuts. Rusty, please. And uh, this is Jerry Mead. Ah, how do you do, Miss Fairfax? I'm delighted to see another of the fair sex in our midst. Really, you're quite beautiful, you know. Oh, <laughs> You don't lose any time starting to work, do you, Mr. Me? <laughs> Not me. I believe in cutting all corners. Yes, and I believe in cutting all comers. <laughs> that should put you in your place, if you have one, Jerry. Oh, you know I'm only kidding with her, Sue. Yes. You'd better be only kidding. Uh, tell me, what is your business, Mr. Me? I- I'm a prospector. I'm searching for that filthy thing called gold. You, a prospector? I thought all prospectors were old and had whiskers and rode mules. <laughs> well, not all of us, my dear. You see, I studied metallurgy in college, and I've come out here to put some of the new methods to a test. Struck pay dirt yet? No, but I'm getting pretty close to it. Well, Mr. Mead doesn't stop at my establishment, just takes his meals here. He has a cabin of his own out back about a quarter of a mile. Well, I uh, must say you have a very interesting little group here, Mr. Bedlam. Uh, yes, indeed, Dr. Denfield. And uh, now may I start carving the lamb? It's very fresh. I killed it myself this morning. Dr. Danfield. Hmm? Oh, oh, it's you, Mrs. Pierce. I'm sorry I didn't hear you come out. I I was out here watching the sand blow. Dr. Danfield, you've got to take me away from here. Uh, The wind is howling so loud. What did you say? I said you've got to take me away from here. Well, now, Mrs. Pierce, I... I can't stand it. I can't stand it. The desert, the barrenness, the loneliness. That darn wind. Well, why don't you have your husband My take... My husband, I hate him. I hate him. What if you hate him? Why did you... Did you think a girl such as I, young, virile, and... Yes, beautiful. You think I could love a doddering old man who's over twice my age, do you? Do you? Then why did you marry him? Why did any young girl marry an old man? Money. Position. Mrs. Pierce, you should have thought about that before you got yourself mixed up in this mess. Gotta get away. I'll die if I don't. Oh, you will take me with you, won't you, Doctor? I'm sorry, Mrs. Pierce, but I never interfere where a man and wife are concerned. I'll have to say no. You've got to take me. You've got to take me. No. Oh, Mrs. Pierce, please, please. Now, stop it, will you? Oh, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I... You will? You take me with you. I, I didn't say that. I said I'll... Take your arms away from Dan, you, you three-timer. Rusty, I didn't hear you come out. If that woman doesn't drag herself out of your arms this instant, nobody will hear her go in. Now, look, Pierce, you've simply got to sell me that painting, The Skeleton of the Cow. I'm at liberty to offer you $20,000. I've told you before, Mr. Wakefield, my paintings are not for sale. But why? Why? Why, why just look at these walls, literally covered with your work. Yes, just look at them. My babies, my creations, everyone a masterpiece. And to think I did them all myself. And you ask me to sell them? Bah! Well, but I'm only asking for one. And $20,000 is a lot of money. Money? What is money compared to a great art? Well, money means something to me, even if it doesn't to you. I have a client who wants that picture. If you won't sell it, I stand to lose good profit. And I won't sell. That's your last word? My last word is no. You stubborn old cuss. You may be nearer to your last word than you think. And uh, now, Mr. Bedlow, Rusty and I really would like to take a look at Mr. Pierce's paintings. That is, if you think he won't mind. Well, uh, come on, we'll see if the old boy's in. Right. Uh, It doesn't seem to be. Uh, He just went out. Come on, I'll I'll show them to you. Maybe he doesn't care to have us look at them. Well, not Pierce. He loves it. He does this quite often. Does what? Well, he sneaks out of the room when anybody's looking at his paintings and listens into what they say on the other side of the door. How odd. Uh, queer is the word. He's a vain old chap. I should warn you, don't say anything detrimental to his work. Well, come on. All right. Did 
again. Just look at these paintings. Must be at least 50. Yes, yes. Pierce is nothing if not prolific. Well, he's a productive dynamo. I'm sure he lives for nothing but to paint. Well, no wonder his wife is turning to newer pastures. The old fellow can't have very much time for her. Not into all this, too. She'd better stay in her own backyard if she knows what's good for her. Oh, careful, the old chap will hear you. Oh, by the way, Mr. Bedlow, uh, which is the one you admire so much? The one you were speaking of at dinner? The dry water hole? Yes, yes. I believe you called it uh, the dead cow. Oh, yes, here it is, right, right over here. Oh, Oh, you know. Dan, it's horrible. If you ask me, it stinks. Who? Who said that? I did, Mr. Pierce. Why, you, you, you dare to criticize my work? Me, Harvey Pierce? But, but I me, have... the greatest landscape artist alive today? I'll have you know, young lady, that you know nothing what? of art. Each and every painting on that wall is a master. Well, I know. Now get out, get out, get out. Then I think we'd better go. Yes, indeed. Come along, both of you. Get out! Get out! Dad, that, that poor old man nearly had apoplexy. Uh, he's positively a neurotic. Uh, interesting, uh, Dr. Danville. Inter do people die of neurosis? Uh, not usually, Mr. Bedlow, but uh, it can be a contributing factor. Very really interesting. Well, I suppose you'd both like to go to your room? Yes, yes, I'm uh, rather tired. I'm just plain sleepy. Yes, it was always nice to have a good night's sleep. So uncertain, though. What do you mean? One never knows whether one will ever wake up again. Does one? Mr. Boric Bedlow, do you want to know something? What, my dear? I wish you'd crawl way off somewhere and die. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return for the third act of Danger, Dr. Danfield. But first... Now back to Michael Dunn for the third act of Danger, Dr. Danfield. That is. Where are my shoes? No! Dan, Dan, what's happening? Oh, it sounds like Sue Pierce. Come on, she's downstairs. Well, what would Sue be doing downstairs at this time in the morning? Well, I don't know. Oh. Hey, she's in the room where the paintings are. Help! Please, somebody help! Oh, Mrs. Pierce, what? what? Look! Oh, uh, Dan. What, what's going on in here? It's Harvey. What? Oh, he's dead. I know it. I can tell. It's not only dead, Mr. Bedlow. Mr. Pierce has been murdered. Everybody here, Mr. Bedlow? Yes, indeed. Everybody, that is, except Jerry Mead. He lives in the shack out back, you know. Well, I wouldn't bother sending out for him. I can talk to him in the morning. Oh, this is terrible, Dr. Danfield. Poor old Pierce. Yes, Mr. Wakefield. Murder is always terrible. Yeah, it's uh, strangely quiet. Something seems to be missing. Uh, it's the wind. The wind has stopped blowing. It's always quiet when there's no wind. Yes, yes, that must be it. No wind and uh, no coyotes. Oh, beg your pardon, my mistake. Now, uh, let's see... Uh, Apparently, from the condition of Mr. Pierce's body, he was killed about two hours ago by a bullet through his heart. Now, uh, Mrs. Pierce, just how did you happen to discover the body? I went to bed about 11. Shortly before 3, I woke up and saw that Harvey hadn't come up yet. I thought maybe he'd fallen asleep down here, so I came down to bring him up to bed. Yes? When I came in here, the light was out. I lit it. Yes, that's enough, Mrs. Pierce. We know the rest. Mr. Wakefield, what time did you go to bed? Oh, I don't know. Uh, about 11.30, I guess. Bedlow, how about you? Well, right after you and Miss Fairfax went upstairs, about 12 o'clock. Oh. And what time did Jerry Mead leave to go to his cabin? Well, right after dinner. I let him out the door myself. Good, good. Now, uh, did any of you wake up, say, around 1 o'clock? Were any of you startled by a sharp sound? Dan, 
What are you getting at? Well, that's about the time Pierce must have been killed. I want to know if anybody heard the shot. Well, I hardly believe any of us could have heard the shot in Danfield, not the way the wind was blowing. Yes, yes, you may be right. Hey, Dan, one of the pictures is missing. Hmm? Where? Right up there, see? Where the wall is faded. Hmm. There's a perfect outline of where a painting has been hung. Yes, yes, so it is. Well, Mr. Bedlow, would you have any idea as to just what painting has been hanging there? Well, by George, yes, it's been stolen. That, that was the picture of the dead cow. It's a beautiful morning, R.R.C. It's hot. Oh, well, you've got to expect a little heat on the desert, especially in Death Valley, you know. This is silly, walking around before breakfast. Well, yeah, do you good. Work up an appetite. Good fresh air. Just look at that sand, Rusty, just like driven snow. A gray, clean, windswept carpet. Not a blemish or a mark on it. Waves of sand. Yep, and uh, pretty soon a bunch of animals called men will come out and muss it all up again, just like we're doing right now. Say, that must be Jerry Mead's cabin way over there. Yeah. Mm hmm. Looks like he has already come over for breakfast. How can you tell that? Footprints, silly. See that unbroken line of footprints coming from his cabin? Oh, sure, I see him. And uh, as there is only one set of footprints and they're coming this way, none going back, I therefore surmise that Jerry has arrived for breakfast. <laughs> Wouldn't take a hawk shot to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Morning, Dr. Danfield, Mr. Fairfax. Out taking constitutional? Oh, just getting in the mood for some of your ham and eggs. Got the murder figured out yet? No, no, but I'm working on it. Oh, say, uh, would you mind sending Jerry Mead out? I'd like to have a little talk with that boy. Jerry Mead? Yes. Send him out, please, will you? Well, I'm afraid I can't send him out. Uh, Jerry hasn't come over from his cabin as yet. <laughs> It's uh, me, Jerry, Dr. Danfield. Can I come in? Sure, walk right in. Door isn't locked. Well, you're uh, rather a late riser, huh, Jerry? Oh, yeah, I'm taking the day off today. Thought I'd sleep in. Why didn't you bring your little honey with you? Rusty, we'll uh, leave Rusty out of this, if you don't mind. Okay, I don't mind. Well, what'd you come over for? Certainly not to see if I wash behind my ears. No, no, Jerry. I'm, uh, I'm investigating a supernatural phenomenon. Ghost? No, 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 I don't think so, Jerry. I'm just wondering how a man could walk over to the hotel from this cabin in the dead of night, leaving a perfectly clear trail of footprints, kill a man, and then get back to this cabin without leaving a mark. Well, who did that? I uh, was hoping that it might be you. Me? Yes. Say, what is this? Hey, wait a minute. Did you say somebody was killed? I did. Who? Old Harvey Pierce. Harvey? Oh, <laughs> Oh, hey, that's wonderful. Now Sue can get out of the desert. Uh, mind if I take a look around your cabin, Jerry? Well, what for? Well, there's a gun missing. Also, one of Pierce's paintings. One of the old boy's paintings? Well, you couldn't get one of those things inside this cabin, let alone hide it. Yes, yes, I guess you're right. Unless the canvas was cut out of the frame and rolled up. Oh, I wish I could think of things like that. Now, oh, come on, Danfield. I'll help you look. <laughs> looking for now, Dan? Uh, the missing gun, Rusty. Oh, be careful how you pull out those drawers. Old Borax will hear you and come a running. You think Borax did it? No, no, but I'm not passing up any chances. What I can't figure out is what happened to that picture. We've looked everywhere. Simply can't hide anything that big in a place like this. Maybe they cut it out of the frame, like you said. Well, then what happened to the frame? Well, maybe they burned it. Where are the ashes? We've looked everywhere. Maybe they buried them in the sand. Uh-uh, I couldn't do it, Rusty. Not if the murder was committed like I think it was. After the wind had gone down, there would be a big mark on the sand where they buried it. And a set of footprints to and from the place. Ha! Then are we dumb. Hmm? What brought on that remark? You have been looking in all these dresser drawers for a gun. Yes. And here's one lying right on top of the dresser. Right back here by the mirror. Well, what do you know? Well, our murderer is a far cleverer man than I imagined. What makes you say that? Well, if this is the murder weapon he is... He hid it by not hiding it at all. No one ever looks where you don't have to look, you know. Let's see now. Yes, it's uh, been cleaned recently. What does that prove? Only that it's probably been used recently. Oh. Mm, two empty shelves. 
Uh, very careless of him. Yes, I should think he would have replaced them. Well, most likely this wasn't his gun. It's an old type 44. Shells of this type are hard to obtain. If it was his own gun, he would have had some. Wait a minute, Dan. Two empty shells. Mm-hmm. There was only one wound in Mr. Pierce's body. Yes. Yes, and that clears up a lot of things, Rusty, I think. That and the smart way our friend had of hiding things. Come on, Rusty, let's get this mob all together in Mr. Pierce's studio. As we say in geometry, QED. This case is solved. Well, they're all here, Danfield. Well, thanks, Bedlow. Well, come on, Danfield, out with it. I want to see what kind of a case you teamed up about me so I can get in touch with my lawyer. You tried to buy the picture, didn't you, Wakefield? Well, of course I did, but I didn't steal it. I'm rather inclined to believe you. You uh, hated your husband, didn't you, Mrs. Pierce? I did. There's no use denying it. I told you myself. Enough to kill him? I don't know. Maybe I would have if somebody else hadn't saved me the trouble. I see. Borax, how about you? Well, surely, Dr. Danfield, you don't think I did it. What possible reason would I have to kill a paying customer? You're almost a psychopathic case, Mr. Bedlow. You have an obsession about death. You better watch yourself that you don't someday cross over the borderline and actually commit one of the crimes you're always dreaming about. Why, I... uh, Yes, yes, maybe you're right. Hmm. Now, uh, you, Rusty. Me? Well, Dan, I I didn't do it. (laughs) Now, I'm certain about you, Rusty. I I just want to ask you a question. Don't scare me like that. If you were going to hide a needle, Rusty, where would you hide it? Oh, that's easy. In a haystack. <laughs> yes, yes, but uh, everybody hasn't got a haystack. Where next? Why, why in with another bunch of needles, I guess. Right. Now, Jerry, where would you hide a picture if you wanted to hide one? But I don't want to hide a picture. Well, that doesn't answer my question. I know. With a bunch of other pictures. Right again, Rusty. So, uh, let's take a look around, shall we? There's about 50 pictures in this very room. Well, I see it. I see it. The dead cow. Yes, isn't it? Right over here on the opposite side of the room. Well, then it wasn't stolen at all. Oh, yes, it was, Jerry. You stole it just as surely as if you had taken it to your own cabin. And just as surely as you murdered the man who painted it. Why, you're crazy. I wasn't even over here last night. The tracks in the sand proved that. The tracks in the sand prove that you were over here. The only thing they don't prove is that you went back to your cabin. Well, if you're so brilliant, then, how did I get back? We'll get to that later. Right now, I want to look behind this picture. Why, then? Well, I think we'll find a bullet hole. A hole from the bullet that we didn't find in Mr. Pierce. There. There, you see, Jerry? I'll bet that hole was made by a forty-four. But it wasn't my gun. Oh, Jerry. Up to a point, you were so clever. Now you have to go and spoil it all. Oh? Uh-huh. And how did you come to that conclusion? By proclaiming the fact that it wasn't your gun, you admitted that you know whose gun it was. Well, nobody but the murderer would know that, Jerry. Mr. Bedlow, would you mind calling the sheriff? In a moment, we return for the conclusion of Danger, Dr. Danfield. But first... Turn to Michael Dunn for the conclusion of Danger, Dr. Danfield. You know, Dan, you're the luckiest guy. Oh? What do you mean, lucky? Why, if that Jerry hadn't made that crack about the gun, you never would have found out. Oh, you think so, Rusty? Of course. Now, why don't you admit it? Are you uh, forgetting the footprints, Rusty? The single track pointing right from Jerry's cabin of the hotel? What about those footprints? Well, Rusty, here's what happened. Jerry came over to either buy or steal that painting. He heard Wakefield offer 20000 for it, and uh, he thought he had a chance to find gold quick without uh, having to dig for it, you see. Well, what's that got to do with the footprints? Well, the sand was blowing around like all get out when Jerry came over, and he counted on it covering up all his tracks. But uh, all of a sudden, the wind stopped blowing. You can imagine the quandary our boyfriend was in. He committed a murder, and in the morning there would be a perfect trail, a one-way trail straight to his cabin. Pointing him out like the finger of doom. Oh, my gosh. What did he do? They went back to his cabin. Well, I know. But his footprints were pointing the other way. Of course. That's why he walked backwards. Backwards? Yes. 
What he didn't realize was that anyone walking backwards always puts the weight on the ball of the foot instead of on the heel as they do when walking naturally. It uh, showed up in that nice, clean sand like a kid's drawing of a mustache on his best girl's picture. Oh, oh Dan. I hate those coyotes. Oh, well, uh, come closer and I'll uh, protect you. <laughs> Dan. Oh, uh, yes, Rusty? Do you suppose we could make that darn thing howl again? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 